the last time I was with you from up here, I talked about this unique Unitarian Universalist faith and how it's based on all that is your life, all that your experience and reason show you that you must believe. It's very personal. What you choose to believe based upon what you have learned and imagined and all that has happened in your life, your selections from among the options life has shown you. It is rightly noted that most of those seven, so far seven principles of ours, can be read as being very individualistic, even though they begin with, we, the member congregations, covenant to affirm and promote. That can sound like what we in congregations intend to do and be together, why we gather. Then there's the fifth principle. That fifth principle of ours, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. I've often wondered about that pairing of conscience and democratic process. The first is very much individual. The other is about us and how we make decisions. Recent events, especially of this summer, have me, consider, have me considering that pairing again. To the best of my knowledge, and from casual research and questioning, Unitarian Universalism may be unique in having democracy's process explicitly as a principle of religious faith. You may remember that this summer, the Republican Speaker of the Arizona House, Rusty Bowers, told the U.S. House January 6th Committee that he was testifying because it is a tenet of my faith that the Constitution is divinely inspired, one of my most basic foundational beliefs. Well, did my ears perk up. The faith he was referring to is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS, the Mormons. What is sacred is how the democratic process is implemented in this country. Our UU principle can have wider application. For many years, Maggie and I lived and voted with the good folks in Unity, New Hampshire. On town meeting day in March, always good and cold, we and a few hundred of our neighbors would mark our paper ballots, enjoy coffee and baked goods from the PTA, hear reports, have our say, approve a budget, and get the results of the voting. Eventually, we'd go home with our town ready to function for another year. It's a whole lot like UU congregational meetings. Where we live now, Elections have us, have had us among the poll workers. We've been trained in the way voters are checked in, how the number of voters and ballots and votes are carefully recorded and tabulated and correlated and rechecked by all the people involved at the polling place. I have a high degree of confidence in the parts of the voting system I have direct experience with as a voter and as a poll worker. And I suppose you've all noticed that there are those who claim that democracy in this country, especially the voting, is not working honestly. To me, as an American, as a voter, and especially as a Unitarian Universalist with the democratic process as a principle of faith, to me, this sowing of distrust in the democratic process is alarming. It is frightening, but there's hope. A survey of voters in swing states found that over a third did not trust the process for counting votes. And given the deliberate, deliberate misinformation and outright lies that we hear, that's no surprise. But the executive director of Voting Rights Lab, that's the organization that commissioned the heartening survey, Megan Lewis is her name, she tells us that the good news from our research is that we found by appealing to the values 
that American voters hold dear, things like freedom, independence, and a longing for unity, that we actually can persuade voters that the big lie is really nothing more than a partisan power grab. At first, 64% of all the participants in the survey's various groups said they do trust the process for counting votes. And then a subgroup was given statements to read about candidates' rights to challenge election results, but that there must be proof and that election laws must be followed. And let's keep improving our elections and make them more fair, equal, and transparent. The number of voters in the subgroup now trusting the vote count went up to 72%. And the encouraging thing is that the ones most likely to be persuaded were Republican voters. My early schooling involved classes called citizenship education. Ah, you remember. We were taught about elections and how bills become laws and three branches of government and checks and balances. Classes about the democratic process and our place and our role in it. And as I remember from Sid Ed, for any of the pieces to work together, everyone involved has to want them to. It's not magic, it's not automatic. Especially recently, in court cases and hearings, we've seen how vital it is to our democracy that election officials like Rusty Bowers, government staffers and employees, law enforcement officers, judges, and yes, some of our elected leaders, it is vital that they do their sworn duties, uphold their oaths of office, and follow the state's and federal constitution, which is why I bring up our principle pairing the right of conscience and the democratic process today. I'm worried. This country rejected being led by a king who's the head of a national church. And the writers of the Constitution repeatedly affirmed that that document does not reference the one religion's doctrines as the basis of its authority, but rather claims that it comes from the people. Courts in Congress have disallowed efforts by religiously motivated legislators to claim such divine validation. Yet, that wall of state religion separation, which Thomas Jefferson wrote of, is again challenged. The United States Supreme Court Dobbs versus Jackson Women Health decision on the 24th of June this year overturned, invalidated, annulled a previous court's decision, Roe versus Wade, for about 50 years. Roe has been the basis of many of this nation's laws based on a constitutional right to abortion. This court's decision runs 213 pages. It claims that those who found protection of privacy in the Constitution's first, fourth, fifth, ninth, and 14th amendments, and so a right to choose abortion, were and are in error. I've looked. Nowhere in the Constitution is privacy or abortion mentioned, but at the very top of the First Amendment are words which we, as members of a very minority religion, can be thankful for. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the exercise, the free exercise thereof. And then we have a religious principle about conscience and democracy. I am no constitutional scholar. I take those First Amendment words prohibiting an establishment of religion to mean that there is never to be a national religion which we are all expected or required to adhere to, belong to, support, base our laws and lives upon. A quick look around our world finds several nations where one religion and sometimes more than one, but enumerated religions are official or allowed. 
I have lived in a country where that's the case and even helped form a UU fellowship there. We had to do a lot of explaining and found some people willing to work with us. But thankfully, established religion is not to happen here, right? Now, well, Mildred and Richard Loving were arrested, tried, and sentenced to jail for marrying. Her ancestors are Rappahannock Native Americans, his family from Europe. They had violated Virginia's act to preserve racial integrity. They filed a motion in the county circuit court to validate the criminal, to vacate the criminal uh, conviction and set aside the sentences. In 1965, which to some of us doesn't seem so long ago, in 1965, the motion was denied. The judge's ruling included this. Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, melee, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. And but for the interference with this arrangement, there would be no cause for such marriages. The fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend for the races to mix. This decision is not unique among laws and court actions based on religious understandings. The ruling was overturned by the Supreme Court in 1967. Well, the Dobbs ruling of 2022 cites repeatedly a critical moral question. A critical moral question. Just the sort of thing that people may come together in religious settings to discuss and ponder and disagree about. As noted, the current court has ruled that in 1973, Roe decision, which found a right to abortion, was wrongly based on an assumption of a constitutional right to privacy. That may be correct, but there is that constitutional protection from established religion. Americans' constitutional right to religious freedom seems to be violated by the court's Dobbs decision. In my learning and reading, I have not found a specific moment recognized by science when a fertilized ovum becomes a human being. And so, the court, in its Dobbs decision, denying a nationwide right to abortion, is imposing on us all a religious opinion on a critical moral question. Is that constitutional? I have an opinion about many matters, including abortion, but that should not be imposed on anyone else. It is an opinion based on one person's conscience and religious beliefs. Here's another. I have an opinion that people seeking essential medical care should be able to make their own decisions based on their own beliefs. It should not be a matter of my views or those of politicians, judges, voters, or any religious leaders. Many faith groups and individuals, including many Unitarian Universalists, claim Dobbs violates their religious freedom. Court cases are filed. According to the Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, the president of our Unitarian Universalist Association, this anti-choice decision by the Supreme Court infringes on our deeply held religious beliefs. Access to abortion and the right to choose is an issue of gender equality, bodily autonomy, and religious liberty, all of which are long-held Unitarian Universalist religious teachings. And we're in good company. Over 50 faith groups united to try to discourage the, the Dobbs ruling, but the court has decided. 150 faith groups called upon Congress to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. Now that would protect a person's ability to determine whether to continue or end a pregnancy. It passed the House of Representatives. It was defeated in the US Senate. 
none of which does any good for a pregnant woman's right to decide on health care she needs. Now, since Dobbs, her right is in the hand of state legislators and voters. So now, it is up to the U.S. Congress to pass national laws protecting her rights, including religious rights, nationwide. Which brings me back to democracy. Democracies can, democratically, vote themselves out of existence. Look at Tunisia just a month ago. Look at Hungary and Turkey and Brazil and the Philippines and sadly others ongoing in this century. Look at our world in the last century. Some of us remember. You know, like the Israelites shouting, we want a king. Then it would be like all the other nations with some one to lead us. A dictator, an autocrat, an authoritarian. And in a democracy, there is the danger, the ever-present possibility that without guaranteed enumerated rights, the majority will win a vote which infringes on the liberty of everybody else. Civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, the rights of differently abled human beings, immigrants' rights, and yes, voting rights. They and more have been and are the victims of a majority's rules and opinions and assumptions about how the world is or should be. And so have the rights of followers of not the majority religions. The various Christian denominations account for about two-thirds of Americans claiming religious affiliation. The Armed Forces Chaplains Board recognizes 221 faith groups. So even with the reasonably unambiguous wording of the First Amendment, Muslims, Sikhs, Jews, Hindus, and yes, Unitarian Universalists are among the many religious people without the same place in the society and culture and political establishments, opinions, decisions, and assumptions as have Protestants, Catholics, Mormons, and Orthodox Christians. We need to know this. This faith, with its exceptional assortment of principles, calls upon us to affirm and promote the right of conscience and democracy's process within our congregations and in society at large. As with all our principles, that seems not a universally popular or safe stand, particularly in our times, but a stand we are still called upon to take. So be it. Blessed be, and amen.